In the extreme southeast of Germany lies the land of a thousand lakes. Until the Middle Ages, it was mostly bogland. Even today, this is remembered in the Sorbian word Wuschica, meaning swamp or bog. The term gave rise to the name of the region, Lusatia. Aquatic kingdoms of water and fish attract astonished visitors. But Lusatia also has a dark side. Lignite or brown coal. Mining it turns vast areas literally inside out. Where East Germany and Poland once met, today new landscapes are emerging, alien looking and as deserted as at the beginning of time. Nature, however, never admits defeat. Wolves follow their prey. The newly developed insect life attracts exotic birds. And domestic species find new habitats. By the early morning, the lake has already become a stage for the mute swan, who is striking a pose. The male bird is offering an invitation to a very special dance. Water striders and whirligig beetles seem to have got into the mood as well. Mute swan romance is rather curious, but then she already knows this from last year. The couples stay together their whole lives. Moor frogs are among the first spring envoys in Lusatia. When the sun warms up the water surface, the males turn sky blue, thanks to pigments under their skin. For the females, blue is not just blue. Researchers recently established that the frogs can perceive subtle nuances and prefer dark blue males, while the pale ones fight it out on the open water. What an opportunity. The great bittern doesn't leave the protection of the reeds very often. And when it does, only for good reason. A pool full of love-struck frogs is a good reason. The bittern begins the hunt underwater. It extends its neck out like a telescope, edging its beak ever closer to the quarry. The very first blow hits the target. A startled frog makes easy sport. A muffled sound distracts the male bittern, the territorial signal of arrival. It demands a prompt reply. 
the male gets into position and starts sucking in air. One to two litres are pumped in, before being shot out again vigorously. The inflated gullet serves as a base amplifier. With their call audible for kilometres, great bitterns establish their acoustic territorial borders. It's clear why they're known as moor oxen. The call of the crane is very different, high-pitched and piercing. More and more cranes are coming to the lake region, not only to rest, but also to breed. The first chick is welcomed excitedly. Then everything is suddenly quiet. The parents don't want to attract predators as long as they're still nesting. The second chick will hatch during the night or the next morning. Then the crane family will leave the nest to find food and shelter in the undergrowth by the shore. By the time of the Cold War, there were already fish ponds in Lusatia, a centuries-old tradition and peaceful aquatic world. The idyllic scene still appears perfect today. Only a stone's throw away, however, another Lusatia begins. Giant slag heaps lie quiet and abandoned. The earth is bare and depleted, foreboding yet disturbingly beautiful. Coal has thus changed the land. The wounds of the open cast mines are slowly healing. The first settlers are on the water. Cormorants are trying to establish a small colony at the top of some sunken birch trees. The lake is artificial, a flooded mine supplied by nearby rivers. In contrast to many other mine lakes, this one is not overly acidic and is therefore full of fish. Cormorants need fish. If this is nearby and plentiful, the home tree can be second choice. The wedding takes place at the future nesting site, despite swaying branches. Building material is provided by branches floating in the water. They come from trees sunk in the lake. The cormorant's nest is not exactly artistically woven. On the other hand, the rickety island is safe from predators. Poland is only a few kilometres away. The proximity to the green border attracts animal migrants to the wooded swampland of Lusatia. Raccoon dogs have already been here for around 50 years. They feel comfortable in the water-rich environment. The lower Lusatia region is among the first settlement areas for East Asian wild dogs. 
European otters are also not uncommon here, while in other parts of Germany, they are long gone. In contrast to the raccoon dog, the otter is a highly specialised hunter. In clear water, hardly a single fish is safe. The otters devour larger prey on land. Carpets of violets like nowhere else in Germany. A female fox returns to her lair. With cocked ears, she evaluates the atmosphere in the clearing. She has good reason to be cautious. She brings her young into the daylight with subtle calls. The whole thing seems a bit fishy to the young ones. The mother tries again, this time with success. Her six pups seem a bit uncertain at first. They don't hesitate for long, however, and soon their curiosity overcomes their fear. The pups are now six weeks old and try out everything they can during playtime. Chases and play fights are right at the top of the list of favourites. Through playing, the young foxes train all of the behaviour patterns they'll need in later life. It's not long until the tummies are rumbling. A little nose prodding at the corner of mum's mouth means, hey, I'm hungry. Mother's milk is still the main source of nutrition for the young foxes. It's important that the pups really drink their fill. When the mother is off on hunting trips, the youngsters often have to stay alone at the lair for several hours. Very nearby, a sensation is looming. Elk. They love the peaceful wooded swampland close to the border, which is full of their favourite food. Young shoots, branches and leaves in abundance. The female elk is also here for another reason. In 1996, an elk calf was born in Lusatia perhaps the first in Germany since their extinction 200 years ago. Whether they can settle here again permanently is an open question. The wealth of fish in the lake attracts sea eagles, Sometimes dozens of them flock here together. Now and then the birds of prey work as health authorities. These ones are gathering up carp, which have died from a viral infection. <laughs> 
thanks to the abundance of food and intensive protection measures, the sea eagle has become common in the region. Wherever raccoon dogs appear, they quickly tap into new sources of food. These masters of adaption are not all that fussy. This one is sniffing over the muddy bank, centimetre by centimetre. His subtle nose detects tadpoles, insect larvae or frogs, even buried deep in the slime. In late May, the deep bass call of the great bittern is only rarely heard. In the twilight, in the dense reeds, the birds are virtually invisible. The reason for the secrecy, four young bitterns. Only days old, they hunker down in a kind of kraal made from bulky cane. The chicks pant in the midday sun. Cane stalks hardly provide any shade. The adult bird approaches very carefully for feeding time. Although it's only a few metres away, the bird's silhouette cannot be seen. The grasping of the upper beak triggers a reflex in the parents. Frogs and small fish are accurately transferred from the big gullet to the small one. The bittern disappears almost silently into the brush. For the chicks, it's siesta time. Among the cane tops, great reed warblers have made their nest from reeds. Another variety of bittern has established itself among the warblers. The little bittern is a rarity. Intense activity in the nest accompanies the changing of the guard. Six chicks are fiercely demanding fresh supplies in the form of small fish. Little bitterns are by far the smallest herons in Europe. They're only about the size of doves and exceptionally hard to film. They've perfected their hidden life among the stalks. When not in flight, they are close to invisible. At any sign of trouble, the little bittern freezes instantly. If the threat comes any closer, the bird stretches out its body and merges with the surrounding forest. In any case, the otter was only interested in fish. Fish are plentiful in the lake region of Lusatia. Herons don't often land three-pounders like this one. The carp has to be swallowed whole, and that only works with a bit of momentum. Fish farming, cultivated for centuries, has many profiteers. More and more new species are becoming native to Lusatia. As well as raccoons and raccoon dogs, whooper swans are by now part of the usual scene. For several years now, the northern relatives of our mute swan 
have even been raising their young in the region. However, tranquility rarely lasts long in Lusatia. Power stations are demolished or modernized. Colossal diggers eat into coal seams. Old mines are filled with water and entire rivers are laid down. Huge areas of Lusatia have already been dug up in this way. The result, a radically changed landscape. What used to be underground now lies on the surface. Mountains of excavated earth lie from horizon to horizon. The efficiency of the machines is astounding. Day and night, they constantly remove soil, creating, on the earth, lunar landscapes. Can these waste heaps be revitalized? Back in 1930, the recultivation of these areas began, a long and complicated task. And there are always surprises. Wolves are living again in Germany, migrating from Poland they had set foot here by the end of the 90s. For years, they've been prowling around virtually unnoticed on the edges of the old coal mines. A few cubs wander through the young pines, not far from the surface mine. Their parents have buried some meat here. Ravens are often heard wherever wolves are eating. The cunning birds quickly learn how to secure a portion or two for themselves. Thus, in many hiding places, not much is left over apart from an intense aroma. In the meantime, multiple wolf packs are living in Lusatia, and they're spreading. Although not everyone is happy about it, Germany does seem to be a wolf country again. Like the surface mines, extensive military practice grounds are stamped all over Upper Lusatia. Many of these are still active exclusion zones, but despite the noise and gunfire, they're a small El Dorado. Solitary bees, honeybees, and bumblebees have ignored the noise in pursuit of the tiny heather blossom nectar. A robber fly lands in the web of a sheet weaver. Within seconds, the much smaller spider has disabled the insect. Then it ties up its prey to calmly devour later. Rabbits dig their warrens in the sandy heathland. You can meet them in the morning light having a sunbathe. If it's a really warm day, another kind of wolf is active, the bee wolf, a type of wasp with unbelievable strength. The female bores meter-long tunnels in the sand, which branch out at the ends. That's where she lays her eggs. Then the wolf goes hunting for bees. 
so that the offspring has food right after hatching, it puts the paralysed bee in the brooding chamber as live prey. A real act of strength. The hoopoe is also here for the insects. It only breeds when there is enough animal prey for the offspring. If there are no nesting trees available, it makes use of artificial brooding hollows. The eye-catching bird with the cap is commonly seen in the heath landscape. He can't survive in regions with intensive agriculture. It's the same for the tropically coloured bee-eaters. They also mostly live in southern Europe and came to Germany only sporadically. Now, however, with enough warmth and insect life, the bee-eaters are also reappearing. They're already regular guests in many central German mining areas, which have steep slopes in abundance for digging tunnels for the family. How do bee-eaters find their insect paradise? Apparently, individual birds always look for suitable breeding areas. These pioneers are on the spot in good insect years and establish small colonies. In October, the water levels drop in the Lusatian lakes, a reminder that they're man-made. Fishermen drain the lakes off to make them better to fish. Many animals can even cross the now flat reed basins on foot. Rutting season is coming soon for the red deer and the animals are gathering. The stags are shooing the females around a bit. They're not getting any takers yet, however. The deer move elegantly through the surface water. On sunny autumn days, it has the feel of a tropical swamp. The reeds don't only offer the doe's protection from their bold admirers. The leaves also taste pretty good. Finally, they've arrived. A military practice ground turns into a rutting stage every year for almost 1,000 red deer. The animals won't be disturbed on the shooting range by people gathering mushrooms or walking dogs. Besides, there is a ban on hunting for the whole summer. The Moscow military area is enormous and has existed since the days of the Iron Curtain. 20,000 football pitches could be laid here. Red deer are drawn here instinctively as drills and manoeuvres have left behind a landscape similar to the park-like habitat of their ancestors. Here, they have freedom. Firing ranges furrowed by tanks become arenas. Younger stags use every attention slip of the dominant male to sidle up to a female. They constantly keep the highest ranking animal on his toes. Time and again, he must prove that he is the strongest.
The open forest steppe is an ideal rutting venue. Competitors spot each other from a great distance and measure their strength in generally small skirmishes. And those who all the fuss is about also keep an eye on things. On this Lusatia military ground, it's obvious that red deer are not the born forest animals that many still assume. Given the choice, they prefer half open spaces, even with wolves nearby. In the Muskawa Haida, with the help of heavy military equipment, a landscape is formed for which aurochs and bison herds were once responsible. Who would have guessed that a tank could do such a job? The effects of open mining are still profound. In this landscape, no stone has been left unturned. But it doesn't take long for nature to regain control. With a mix of fascination, excitement and concern, a new start can be seen within only a few years. And mankind is far from being the only recultivator. Birds react quickly to the changing water levels of the flooded areas. In migration season, unusually high numbers often gather. Great egrets, another southern species, have become much more common in recent years. And we mustn't forget him. The raccoon adapts very quickly to new conditions. In the flooded but mostly ophoracidic new lakes, fish are very rare. In the neighboring ponds, however, he is well supplied. Raccoons, originally from North America, are now a stable part of the Lusatian animal population. Raccoons have very sensitive front paws, which they use to skillfully feel over anything edible. Cranes also arrive when old mines are flooded. Even if there's not much for them to grab here, the surface water, as well as the peaceful sandbanks, are popular sleeping and resting places, and the sea eagles don't seem to bother them. Now he has respect for the large waders. The eagle grabs his intended fish only when the crane is a few steps away. It's rare to see these large birds so close and seemingly peaceful, side by side. The autumn days are getting shorter and shorter. The cranes are getting itchy feet, or should that be itchy wings? The starting signal for departure. The sandbank seems to have been made especially for a decent run-up. No time to hesitate.
In late autumn, massive flocks of birds pass over the lake area. Black-headed gulls are straight on the scene as soon as the fishing is dried up. In shallow water, they go after the dregs, nose-diving for roach, perch and bellica. And the gulls aren't the only visitors. In autumn, the lakes become important resting points for migrants. At this time of year in Lusatia, not only the autumn leaves are radiant, the water also glitters brightly not because of oil, but rather bacteria which decay the pond bottoms. Iron, manganese or sulphur, red, white, turquoise or brown, each colour stands for an element made fascinatingly visible. Soon after, the pond landscape freezes over. Mines and their resulting landscapes dominate many regions of Lusatia today. They show unmistakably the consequences of our thirst for energy. Almost 70,000 tonnes of brown coal are still burned every day at the Boxberg power station alone. Sulfuric vapour and acid rain do indeed belong in the past. For now, however, the environmental upheaval continues in Lusatia. Nevertheless, the ponds remain to this day untouched refuges. Some species are even easier to observe here in winter than in summer. European otters are very active right now. Mute swans don't head south. When the ponds are frozen over, they search for food under the snow in typical fashion, covering field after field. The great bittern has to go to the open water to fish. It's clear how reluctant they are to leave the protective reeds, but they have no choice. What was that? The northern goshawk is reason enough for the bittern to sneak slowly back to the reeds. But the bird of prey attacks. The bittern valiantly launches a counter attack. It bristles, splays its feathers, makes itself bigger, and fans out its wings. A whole arsenal of moves intended to fluster the assailant. Behaviour which has never been filmed until now.
Then the danger passes. The female hawk gives up. The bittern disappears into the reeds, finally well concealed again. In winter, the American mink lives from fishing, like the great bittern. He also can't eat his catch in peace. A hungry buzzard is watching him. The mink runs off with the prey to his bankside den. It's not clear whether the buzzard wants the fish or the mink. Its talons, however, aren't long enough to fish either of them out of the hole. The mink watches the scene from the emergency exit, only a few metres away. The buzzard just won't give up. Finally, the mink can slip away with his loot, and, after the hawk, the second raptor of the day is left with nothing. The bittern hazards another attempt. This time the skies are clear and the heron can concentrate on hunting. The common kingfisher is also a fish eater and needs areas of open water to survive in winter. Today's a good day for fishing. Both birds struggle when everything freezes over in harsh winters, but that doesn't happen often in Lusatia. As early as February, when it's still icy, the calls of the whooper swan ring out once again. At this time, mating pairs find each other or consolidate their bonds. If new swans come as well, there's quite a commotion at first. With the whooper swans, it's not just about the partner right now, but also the territory. Feathers can fly at this point. With the situation cleared up, peace quickly sets in again. The sea eagles are getting restless, however, they know that fish are in store, under the surface ice. Many fish have been suffocated, but like in a fridge, they're well conserved. Only this fridge has no door, yet. Claws and beaks are used as icebreakers. In summer, their fish catching looked more elegant and above all, was more efficient. But the eagles are not giving up their ice fishing that easily. At last, the fish is on the ice, but there's no time to waste. The first uninvited guests are already arriving. The crows quickly get the upper hand. 
The eagles aren't managing to eat in peace anymore. Now even a red kite tries to scavenge a few bites. Quite right too, the pond isn't his territory. Lusatia, an area full of subtle beauty and striking opposites. Part of the green bond which today connects east and west. Full of old cultural landscapes and opulent habitats in the heart of Europe. A place where Mother Nature faces stiff challenges. and convincingly proves how dynamic, adaptable, and resourceful she is. Since nature will not be restricted by any borders, in Lusatia, she has created an exciting new wilderness.